Section 8. The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lewis Richardson. The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1. The Horse of the Invisible, by William Hope Hodgson. Part 2. After lunch, I thought I would take a few experimental photographs of Miss Hiskins and her surroundings. Sometimes the camera sees things that would seem very strange to the normal human eyesight. You see what I mean? With this intention, and partly to make an excuse to keep her in my company as much as possible, I asked Miss Hiskins to join me in my experiments. She seemed glad to do this, and I spent several hours with her, wandering all over the house from room to room, and whenever the impulse came, I took a flashlight of her and the room or corridor in which we chanced to be at the moment. After we had gone right through the house in this fashion, I asked her whether she felt sufficiently brave to repeat the experiments in the cellars. She said yes, and so I rooted out Captain Hiskins and Parsket, for I was not going to take her down even into what you might call artificial darkness, without help and companionship at hand. When we were ready, we went down into the wine cellar, Captain Hiskins carrying a shotgun, and Parsket a specially prepared background and a lantern. I got the girl to stand in the middle of the cellar, while Parsket and the captain held out the background behind her. Then I fired off the flashlight, and we went into the next cellar, where we repeated the experiment. Then, in the third cellar, a tremendous pitch-dark place, something extraordinary and horrible manifested itself. I had stationed Miss Hiskins in the centre of the place, with her father and Parsket holding the background as before. When all was ready, and just as I pressed the trigger of the flash, there came in the cellar that dreadful gobbling neighing that I had heard out in the park. It seemed to come from somewhere above the girl, and in the glare of the sudden light I saw that she was staring tensely upward, at no visible thing. And then, in the succeeding comparative darkness, I was shouting to the captain and Parsket to run Miss Hiskins out into the daylight. This was done instantly, and I shut and locked the door, afterwards making the first and the eighth signs of the Sama ritual opposite to each post, and connecting them across the threshold with a triple line. In the meanwhile, Parsket and Captain Hiskins carried the girl to her mother, and left her there, in a half-fainting condition, whilst I stayed on guard outside of the cellar door, feeling pretty horrible, for I knew that there was some disgusting thing inside. And along with this feeling there was a sense of half-ashamedness, rather miserable, you know, because I had exposed Miss Hiskins to this danger. I had got the captain's shotgun, and when he and Parsket came down again, they were each carrying guns and lanterns. I could not possibly tell you the utter relief of spirit and body that came to me when I heard them coming. But just try to imagine what it was like standing outside of that cellar, can you? I remember noticing, just before I went to unlock the door, how white and ghastly Parsket looked, and the old captain was grey-looking, and I wondered whether my face was like theirs. And this, you know, had its own distinct effect on my nerves, for it seemed to bring the beastliness of the thing bashed down on me in a fresh way. I know it was only sheer will-power that carried me up to the door and made me turn the key. I paused one little moment, and then, with a nervy jerk, sent the door wide open and held my lantern over my head. Parsket and the captain came one on each side of me and held up their lanterns. But the place was absolutely empty. Of course, I did not trust to a casual look of this kind, but spent several hours, with the help of the two others, in sounding every square foot of the floor, ceiling, and walls. Yet, in the end, I had to admit that the place was absolutely normal. And so, in the end, we came away none the wiser. But I sealed the door, and outside, opposite each doorpost, I made the first and last signs of the Sama ritual, joining them, as before, with a triple line. Can you imagine what it was like searching that cellar? When we got upstairs, I inquired very anxiously how Miss Hiskins was. 
and the girl came out herself to tell me that she was all right and that i was not to trouble about her or blame myself as i told her i had been doing i felt happier then and went off to dress for dinner and after that was done with Parsket and i went off to one of the bathrooms to develop the negatives that i had been taking yet none of the plates had anything to tell me until we came to the one that was taken in the cellar Parsket was developing and i had taken a batch of the fixed plates out into the lamplight to examine them i had just gone carefully through the lot when i heard a shout from Parsket, and when i ran to him he was looking at her partly developed negative which he was holding up to the red lamp it showed the girl plainly looking upwards as i had seen her but the thing that astonished me was the shadow of an enormous hoof right above her as if it were coming down upon her out of the shadows and you know i had run her bang into that danger and that was a thought that was chief in my mind as soon as the developing was complete i fixed the plate and examined it carefully in a good light there was no doubt about it at all the thing above miss hiskins was an enormous shadowy hoof yet i was no nearer to coming to any definite knowledge and the only thing i could do was to warn Parsket to say nothing about it to the girl for it would only increase her fright but i showed the thing to her father for i considered it right that he should know that night we took the same precautions for miss hiskins safety as on the two previous nights and Parsket kept me company yet the dawn came in without anything unusual having happened and i went off to bed when I got down to lunch, I learnt that Beaumont had wired to say that he would be in soon after four, also that a message had been sent to the rector, and it was generally plain that the ladies of the house were in a tremendous fluster. Beaumont's train was late, and he did not get home until five, but even then the rector had not put in an appearance, and the butler came in to say that the coachman had returned without him, as he had been called away unexpectedly twice more during the evening the carriage was sent down but the clergyman had not returned and we had to delay the marriage until the next day that night i arranged the defence round the girl's bed and the captain and his wife sat up with her as before beaumont as i expected insisted on keeping watch with me and he seemed in a curiously frightened mood not for himself you know but for miss hiskins he had a horrible feeling he told me that there would be a final dreadful attempt on his sweetheart that night this of course i told him was nothing but nerves yet really it made me feel very anxious for i have seen too much not to know that under such circumstances a premonitory conviction of impending danger is not necessarily to be put down entirely to nerves in fact Beaumont was so simply and earnestly convinced that the night would bring some extraordinary manifestation that I got Parsket to rig up a long cord from the wire of the butler's bell to come along the passage handy. To the butler himself I gave directions not to undress and to give the same order to two of the footmen. If I rang, he was to come instantly with the footmen, carrying lanterns, and the lanterns were to be kept ready lit all night. If for any reason the bell did not ring and I blew my whistle, he was to take that as a signal in the place of the bell. After I had arranged all these minor details, I drew a pentacle about Beaumont and warned him very particularly to stay within it, whatever happened. And when this was done, there was nothing to do but wait and pray that the night would go as quietly as the night before. We scarcely talked at all, and by about 1 a.m., we were all very tense and nervous, so that at last Parsket got up and began to walk up and down the corridor to steady himself a bit. Presently I slipped off my pumps and joined him, and we walked up and down, whispering occasionally, for something over an hour, until, in turning, I caught my foot in the bell cord and went down on my face, but without hurting myself or making a noise. When I got up, Parsket nudged me. "'Did you notice that the bell never rang?' he whispered. Jove, I said, you're right. Wait a minute, he answered. I'll bet it's only a kink somewhere in the cord. He left his gun and slipped along the passage, and taking the top lamp, 
tiptoed away into the house, carrying Beaumont's revolver ready in his right hand. He was a plucky chap, as I think you will admit. Suddenly, Beaumont motioned to me for absolute quiet. Directly afterwards I heard the thing for which he listened, the sound of a horse galloping out in the night. I think that I may say I fairly shivered. The sound died away and left a horrible, desolate, eerie feeling in the air, you know. I put my hand out to the bell cord, hoping that Pasket had got it clear. Then I waited, glancing before and behind. Perhaps two minutes passed, full of what seemed like an almost unearthly quiet. And then, suddenly down the corridor, at the lighted end, the sound of the clumping of a great hoof, and instantly the lamp was thrown down with a tremendous crash, and we were in the dark. I tugged hard on the cord and blew the whistle, then I raised my snapshot and fired the flashlight. The corridor blazed into brilliant light, but there was nothing, and then the darkness fell like thunder. I heard the captain at the bedroom door and shouted to him to bring out a lamp, quick! But instead something started to kick the door, and I heard the captain shouting within the bedroom, and then the screaming of a woman. I had a sudden horrible fear that the monster had got into the bedroom, but in the same instant from up the corridor there came abruptly the vile, gobbling neighing that we had heard in the park in the cellar. I blew the whistle again, and groped blindly for the bell cord, shouting to Beaumont to stay in the pentacle, whatever happened. I yelled again to the captain to bring out the lamp, and there came a smashing sound against the bedroom door. Then I had my matches in my hand to get some light before that incredible unseen monster was upon us. The match scraped on the box and flared up, dully, and in the same instant I heard a faint sound behind me. I whipped round in a kind of mad terror and saw something in the light of the match. A monstrous horse head close to Beaumont. Look out, Beaumont, I shouted in a sort of scream. It's behind you! The match went out abruptly, and instantly there came the huge bang of Pasket's double barrel, both barrels at once fired, evidently single-handed by Beaumont, close to my ear as it seemed. I caught a momentary glimpse of the great head in the flash, and of an enormous hoof amid the belch of fire and smoke, seeming to be descending upon Beaumont. In the same instant I fired three chambers of my revolver. There was the sound of a dull blow, and then that horrible, gobbling neigh broke out close to me. I fired twice at the sound. Immediately afterwards something struck me, and I was knocked backwards. I got to my knees and shouted for help at the top of my voice. I heard the woman screaming behind the closed door of the bedroom, and was dully aware that the door was being smashed from the inside, and directly afterwards I knew that Beaumont was struggling with some hideous thing near to me. For an instant I held back, stupidly, paralysed with funk, and then, blindly and in a sort of rigid chill of goose-flesh, I went to help him, shouting his name. I can tell you I did not feel much of a hero. There came a little choking scream out of the darkness, and at that I jumped forward into the dark. I gripped a vast furry ear, then something stuck me, another great blow, knocking me sick. I hit back, weak and blind, and gripped with the other hand at the incredible thing. Abruptly I was dimly aware of a tremendous crash behind me and a great burst of light. There were other lights in the passage and a noise of feet and shouting. My hand grips were torn from the thing they held. I shut my eyes stupidly and heard a loud yell above me, and then a heavy blow like a butcher chopping meat, and something fell upon me. I was helped to my knees by the captain and the butler. On the floor lay an enormous horse head out of which protruded a man's trunk and legs. On the wrists were fixed great hoofs. It was the monster. The captain cut something with the sword that he held in his hand, and stooped and lifted off the mask, for that is what it was. I saw the face, then, of the man who had worn it. It was Parsket. He had a bad wound across the forehead, where the captain's sword had hit through the mask. I looked bewilderedly from him to Beaumont, who was sitting up, leaning against the wall of the corridor. Then I stared at Parsket again. "'By Jove!' I said at last, and then I was quiet, for I was so ashamed for the man. You can understand, can't you? And he was opening his eyes, and you know— I had grown so to like the man. 
And then, you know, just as Parsket was getting back his wits and looking from one to the other of us and beginning to remember, there happened a strange and incredible thing, for from the end of the corridor there sounded suddenly the clamping of a great hoof. I looked that way, and then instantly at Parsket, and saw a horrible fear in his face and eyes. He wrenched himself round, weakly, and stared in mad terror up the corridor to where the sound had been, and the rest of us stared, all in a frozen group. I remember hearing vaguely half-sobs and whispers from Miss Hiskin's bedroom, all the while that I stirred frightenedly up the corridor. The silence lasted several seconds, and then, abruptly, there came again the clumping of the great hoof, away up at the end of the corridor, and immediately afterward the clunk, 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 clunk of mighty hooves coming down the passage towards us. Even then, you know, most of us thought it was some mechanism of Parsket still at work, and we were in the queerest mixture of fright and doubt. I think everyone looked at Parsket, and suddenly the captain shouted out, Stop this damn fooling at once! Haven't you done enough? For my part, you know, I was frightened, for I had a sense that there was something horrible and wrong. And then Parsket managed to gasp out, It's not me! My God, it's not me! My God, it's not me! And then, you know, it seemed to come home to everyone in an instant that there was really some dreadful thing coming down the passage. There was a mad rush up the passage, and even old Captain Hiskins gave back with the butler and the footman. Beaumont fainted outright, as I found afterwards, for he had been badly mauled. I just flattened back against the wall, kneeling, as I was, too stupid and dazed even to run, and almost in the same instant the pondering hoof-fall sounded close to me, and seeming to shake the solid floor as they passed. Abruptly the great sound ceased, and I knew in a sort of sick fashion that the thing had halted opposite to the open door of the girl's bedroom. And then, you know, I was aware that Parsket was standing, rocking in the doorway, with his arms spread across, so as to fill the doorway with his body. Parsket showed extraordinarily pale, and the blood was running down his face from the wound in his forehead. And then I noticed that he seemed to be looking at something in the passage with a peculiar, desperate, fixed gaze. But there was really nothing to be seen, and suddenly the clunk-clunk, clunk-clunk, recommenced, and passed onward down the passage, and in the same moment Parsket pitched forward out of the doorway onto his face. There were shouts from the huddle of men down the passage, and the two footmen and the butler simply ran, carrying the lanterns. But the captain went against the side wall with his back and put the lamp he was carrying over his head. The dull tread of the horse went past him, and left him unharmed, and I heard the monstrous hoof-falls going away and away through the quiet house. And after that, a dead silence. Then the captain moved and came towards us, very slowly and shaky, with an extraordinarily grey face. I crept towards Parsket, and the captain came to help me. We turned him over, and you know, I knew in a moment that he was dead. But you can imagine what a feeling it sent through me. I looked at the captain, and suddenly he said, That, that, that! I know he was trying to tell me that Parsket had stood between his daughter and whatever it was that had gone down the passage. I stood up and steadied him, though I was not very steady myself. And suddenly his face began to work, and he went down on his knees by Parsket, and cried like some shaken child. And then, you know, I knew that the women were in the doorway of the bedroom, and I turned away and left him to them, whilst I went over to Beaumont. Now, that is practically the whole story, and the only thing that is left to me is to try to explain some of the puzzling parts here and there. Perhaps you have seen that Parsket was in love with Miss Hiskins, and this fact is the key to a good deal that was extraordinary. He was doubtless responsible for some portions of the haunting. In fact, I think for nearly everything. But you know, I can prove nothing, and what I have to tell you is chiefly the result of deduction. In the first place, it is obvious that Parsket's intention was to frighten Beaumont away, and when he found that he could not do this, I think he grew so desperate that he really intended to kill him. I hate to say this, but the facts force me to think so. 
It is quite certain that Parsket was the person who broke Beaumont's arm. He knew all the details of the so-called horse legend, and got the idea to work upon the old story for his own end. He evidently had some method of slipping in and out of the house, probably through one of the many French windows, or possibly he had a key to one or two of the garden doors, and when he was supposed to be away he was really coming down on the quiet and hiding somewhere in the neighbourhood. The incident of the kiss in the dark hall I put down to sheer nervous imaginings on the part of Beaumont and Miss Hiskins. Yet, I must say that the sound of the horse outside of the front door is a little difficult to explain away. But I am still inclined to keep to my first idea on this point, that there was nothing really unnatural about it. The hoof sounds in the billiard room and down the passage were done by Parsket, from the floor below, by pomping against the panelled ceiling with a block of wood tied to one of the window hooks. I proved this by an examination which showed the dints in the woodwork. The sounds of the horse galloping round the house was also done by Parsket, who must have had a horse tied up in the plantation nearby, unless, indeed, he made the sounds himself. But I do not see how he could have gone fast enough to produce the illusion, you see. The gobbling neighing in the park was a ventriloquial achievement on the part of Parsket, and the attack out there on Beaumont was also by him, so that when I thought he was in the bedroom, he must have been outside all the time, and joined me after I ran out of the front door. This is probable. I mean that Parsket was the cause, for if it had been something more serious, he would certainly have given up his foolishness, knowing that there was no longer any need for it. I cannot imagine how he escaped being shot both then and in the last mad action of which I have just told you. He was enormously without fear of any kind for himself, as you can see. The time when Parsket was with us, when we thought we heard the horse galloping round the house, we must have been deceived. No one was very sure, except of course Parsket, who would naturally encourage the belief. The neighing in the cellar is where I consider there came the first suspicion into Parsket's mind that there was something more at work than his sham haunting. The neighing was done by him in the same way that he did it in the park. When I remember how ghastly he looked, I feel sure that the sounds must have had some infernal quality added to them which frightened the man himself. Yet later he would persuade himself that he had been getting fanciful. Of course, I must not forget that the effect upon Miss Hiskins must have made him feel pretty miserable. Then, about the clergyman being called away, we found afterwards that it was a bogus errand, or rather, call, and it is obvious that Parsket was at the bottom of this, so as to get a few more hours in which to achieve his end, and what that was a very little imagination will show you, for he had found that Beaumont would not be frightened away. See what I mean? Then there is no doubt at all that Parsket left the cord to the butler's bell in a tangle, or hitched somewhere, so as to give him an excuse to slip away naturally to clear it. This also gave him the opportunity to remove one of the passage lamps. Then he had only to smash the other, and the passage was in utter darkness for him to make the attempt on Beaumont. In the same way it was he who locked the door of the bedroom and took the key. It was in his pocket. This prevented the captain from bringing a light and coming to the rescue. But Captain Hiskins broke down the door with the heavy fender curb, and it was his smashing the door that it sounded so confusing and frightening in the darkness of the passage. The photograph of the monstrous hoof above Miss Hiskins in the cellar is one of the things that I am less sure about. It might have been faked by Parsket whilst I was out of the room, and this would have been easy enough to anyone who knew how. But, you know, it does not look like a fake. Yet there is as much evidence of probability that it was faked as against, and the thing is too vague for an examination to help to a definite decision, so that I will express no opinion one way or the other. It is certainly a horrible photograph. And now I come to that last dreadful thing. There has been no further manifestation of anything abnormal, so that there is an extraordinary uncertainty in my conclusions. If we had not heard those last sounds, and if Parsket had not shown that enormous sense of fear, the whole of this case could be explained away in the way in which I have shown. And in fact, as you have seen, I am of the opinion that almost all of it can be cleared up. But I see no way of going past the thing we heard at the last, and the fear that Parsket showed. His death? 
No, that proves nothing. At the inquest, it was described somewhat untechnically as due to heart spasm. This is normal enough and leaves us quite in the dark as to whether he died because he stood between the girl and some incredible monster. The look on Paskett's face and the thing he called out when he heard the great hoof sounds coming down the passage seemed to show that he had the sudden realisation of what before then may have been nothing more than a horrible suspicion, and his fear and appreciation of some tremendous danger approaching was probably more keenly real even than mine. And then he did the one fine great thing. And the cause, I said. What caused it? Karnaki shook his head. God knows he answered with a peculiar, sincere reverence. If that thing was what it seemed to be, one might suggest an explanation which would not offend one's reasons, but which may be utterly wrong. Yet I have thought, though it would take a long lecture on thought induction to get you to appreciate my reasons, that Parsket had produced what I might term a kind of induced haunting, a kind of induced simulation of his mental conceptions due to his desperate thoughts and broodings. It is impossible to make it clearer in a few words. But the old story, I said. Why may not there have been something in that? There may have been something in it, said Kornacki quietly. But I do not think it had anything to do with this. I have not clearly thought out my reasons yet, but later I may be able to tell you why I think so. "'And the marriage in the cellar. Was there anything found there?' asked Taylor. "'Yes, the marriage was performed that day, in spite of the tragedy,' Karnaki told us. "'It was the wisest thing to do, considering the things that I cannot explain. "'Yes, I had the floor of that big cellar up, for I had a feeling I might find something there to give me some light. "'But there was nothing. "'You know, the whole thing is tremendous and extraordinary. "'I shall never forget the look on Paskett's face.' and afterwards the disgusting sounds of those great hoofs going away through the quiet house. Karnaki stood up. Out you go, he said in a friendly fashion, using the recognised formula, and we went presently out into the quiet of the embankment, and so to our homes. End of The Horse of the Invisible by William Hope Hodgson Part 2 Recording by David Lewis Richardson, Lancashire, England.